we gather around the table, please? We'll do a stand-up introduction here. I'm David Brown, and uh, I've been a, a, a tracker naturalist now for about 30 so odd years. Um, I misbed my youth in Breakout Reservation across the river, so I'm very familiar with the area around here. I used to live in uh, Cambridge for many years, and I grew up in Walden as well. So this was a hiking destination for me as a boy. And I've always been impressed not only with the beauty of the reservation here, but also with uh, the wildlife content. And I was a birder from the age of 12, and this is where I used to come to see the river. a lot of the birds that I would not see around my own, uh, my own home in Walden. Ecology is the, the study of a relationship between an animal and its habitat. And I use animal tracking as a way of um, accessing that information about, uh, about what, animals are, what animals are doing or why they're present. There were three steps in eco-tracking. Um, the first one is finding. And if there's snow on the ground, finding in the breakout certainly is no big problem. Um, tracks and trails stand out clearly in the snow. Uh, the second step is identif identifying what it is that you found. And that be becomes more awkward um, because uh, um, a lot of animals have similar feet, and, um, and certainly in a, in a uh, metropolitan park, uh, you have a, a lot of uh, a lot of domestic dogs and domestic animals, pets, and so forth. And you need to distinguish the sign of uh, the tracks and trails of from, from wild animals. But there are ways ways to do that that are, that are fairly reliable. The third step is the uh, ecology part, and that's interpreting what you've found and what you've identified to try to figure out the answers to two questions. What was the animal doing and why was it here? This is, this is a, a typical domestic dog track. Um, you see certain things about it. One of them is prominent nails. Um, unless a dog has had its nails clipped, it's probably going to have prominent nails in its tracks because uh, uh, dogs don't dig for a living anymore. When I, was, when I was a young man, you give the dog a bone and it would go up and dig a hole in the backyard to hide the bone from other dogs and from you, presumably, the alpha animal. These are coyote tracks, and you see one of the things that's different about them is that the nail marks are very subtle. And sometimes the outboard, <coughs> this is a front and this is a hide, the outboard nails often don't register at all in a closed toe to uh, re-inhabit their ancestral territories. And so they tend to show some wolf characteristics. They're bigger, bigger animals and they have bigger tracks. Oh, the ones we have here? Hmm? The, the ones I, that we have here, yeah, they're part wolf. The ones in my yard looked awful wolf-like. They really did. Yeah, they're big. Do. Yeah, much more so than Wiley Coyote of the, of the yeah. cartoons. They've got a facial rough to them that's yeah. pronounced, thicker muzzle. Um, they're trying to be wolves, essentially because we don't have a top predator here. But um, they're not very good wolves. <laughs> um, they don't hunt at the uh, direction of an alpha animal. They don't have the kind of social arrangement that wolves have. They have some of that, but not a lot of them. This thing here. That's yeah. That's a buck rub. It's a white tailed deer, male white tailed deer. It inserts its antlers in between um, on either side of the uh, of the tree and then rubs the, the tree up and down. Uh, nobody's altogether sure why they do this, except that you, all, you always find that on a deer trail, and if you look, you'll see the deer trail that runs right up there. See the depressed area in the leaves. Um, the does notice this, but they don't go into ecstasy over it. So it may be a a, a a boy thing. My antlers are bigger than your antlers. When they when they're getting rid of the the uh, the blood filled uh, covering to their antlers as their antlers are growing, the way they do it is they stick their antlers into a shrub and then they thrash their heads around to, to scrub it off, and the the uh, bush looks like it was hit by a grenade. This is uh, this is different altogether. 
A red oak, when it gets to be about 40 years old, is just hitting stride. I mean, it's, it's still shooting for the sky. At about 40 years at this latitude, that's about it for a white oak. They don't grow much faster than that or higher than that. And so they're easily outcompeted by the red oaks. But this is the one with the tasty acorns. You can eat them if you find them, but chances of finding a white oak acorn are fairly slim because the animals love them and they, as I said, they go up the tree and, and cut them off. And yeah, this was originally, no doubt, a uh, woodchuck tunnel. Oh. So the fox dispatches the woodchuck or displaces it and then renovates it in order to, because it needs to enlarge it a little bit. Red foxes are bigger than, bigger than uh, woodchucks. I'm sorry? How many could live in? Um, yeah, they only use it for birthing and raising kits. So it's the female and her kits. This is the peak of their mating season, January. This is so toward the end of their mating season. So she's probably gravid at this point, and she, then they're excavating um, for a uh, for a birthing den. Rest of the year, they don't live in a den. You know, they they'll just they don't have to. They have this big sleeping bag they drag behind them, a big brush. So they can just lay down anywhere and curl that over their nose and their feet. And they're good, the books say, down to about eight degrees Fahrenheit without shivering, without increasing their metabolism or anything. They have really super efficient fur. The red part that you see are just the guard hairs. And underneath, um, they have this white under fur that's very, uh, very insulative. And there's some of it right there. I've been told that they would take the prey back to the den, mm -hmm. whereas maybe later in the year they leave it and they come back. Bring the, to bring the kits to it. Yeah. yeah, why work harder than you have to? Right. Yeah, there's some under for right there if somebody wants to pick that up. The coyotes hunt? Used to be a, uh, an interpretive ranger here named Penny. And this was the ranger cabin. It's a sort of working station for a kid, a pair of uh, boots. Uh, over the knee boots um, that she folded down and stored in the in the ranger cabin. And then when she came in the spring and went to put the boots on, she felt something down the bottom of the boot. And took the boot off and extracted a perfectly mummified flying squirrel that had sailed into her boot and couldn't get out. And I've often wondered about the state of Penny's feet that, that the, the uh, squirrel was perfectly preserved. <laughs> They're beautiful little animals if you've, if you've never seen them. Their, their tails, which they use as kind of a rudder when they're gliding, looks like they just came from the hairdresser. So perfectly. We'll go down to the beach and look at a few tracks. And I'm going to measure that step length. Assuming this is a walking coyote, we've got another direct registration. These are direct registrations. What does that, mean? that means the hind foot impresses over the, the front foot lands and the hind foot comes up and replaces it and impresses right in the outline of the front foot. So average for a coyote is 22 inches. And guess what that is? It's 22 inches. Tons of deer tracks here. The coyote shadow the deer for most of the winter, partly because the, the deer do them the favor of breaking out trails for them, either topple over themselves or the coyotes finish the job. But uh, all of these animals, the coyotes and the deer, are on a strict winter budget. They've got X amount of energy stored and they have to be very careful about how they use it. And one of the ways that the, that the uh, coyote can store energy and keep from spending it is to follow the deer around and the other way is by direct registering when it walks. I can demonstrate that um, as long as nobody takes my picture. <laughs> oh, it's just... <laughs> All right, but basically a diagonal walk, as it's often called. Animals that, uh, that walk, for quadrupeds, mammals at least, in mid-stride they're like that, and the hind foot comes up and replaces the front foot which then moves out ahead 
And then the other hind foot comes up and replaces this one. And that's how a direct registration is done. A moose, because his legs are so long, unless he's forced to yard up, in which case you need, you know, you need, uh, you need snow that's like four feet or deeper that forces them to yard up. Otherwise, uh, they, they uh, find a, a spruce grove or a fir grove and they make a series of, of, of um, trails through it and feed on the, the bark or whatever during the winter. And um, deer do it too, but only, you know, only way up north. And uh, that allows them, once they've packed the trails down, that they can get around and feed at least minimally during, during the winter. Yeah, those are turtle eggs. And the reason that they're there is because turtle eggs taste good. So lots of animals dig them up. Uh, coyotes, foxes, skunks, raccoons will dig up turtle eggs. And uh, they're very nutritious, just as a uh, chicken egg is. Hmm? They're under the sand here. Yeah, the, the nests are under the sand. They, uh, turtles produce a lot of eggs on the expectation that you know, they'll, get, they'll get lucky and some of them won't get discovered. And they like this kind of sandy soil because it's easy to dig in. I was going to take you down to a little peninsula down here, but I looked at it this morning. And there are a couple of uh, otter runs and beaver runs that run back and forth over the top of it, but I didn't see any otter haulouts there. That are, there are several of them on the other side of the river, but we're not going to try to cross the river unless somebody wants to die young. <sighs> the other protection against weasels is that generally a chipmunk tunnel like that goes down about seven to nine inches, and then it turns a 90 degree angle. And the reason for that, presumably, is that the weasel can't follow it down there having a long body and make that turn. What I think we'll do is just go back up to Sprague Lodge and we'll look at some of the casts that are up there and any additional questions that people have. Yeah.